All right, Science 30s, and welcome to our first discussion about uh, electromagnetic energy unit C. We're going to be discussing uh, field lines today. Before I get started, I just want to kind of let you know what part of the textbook you should be referring uh, referring to. Uh, you're going to be looking at unit C, chapter 1, uh, which will be about electric and magnetic fields. That'll be the first half of the unit. Uh, this is going to be on pages 310 to pages 409 of the textbook. As well, you should be accessing page 2 and page three of your uh, Science 30 data booklet uh, for this section of the unit. All right, let's get started with one of my favorite characters from science fiction, a Jedi Master by the name of Obi-Wan Kenobi. Back in the original Star Wars in 1977, he came up with this great line. He said to Luke Skywalker, and I'm paraphrasing, the force is an energy field that cre is created by all things. Uh, it surrounds us, it penetrates us, and it binds the galaxy together. And he's certainly correct. There are actual four forces that hold the universe together. Uh, but first of all, what is a force? What is a, uh, I mean, other than the force in Star Wars, I'm not going to be discussing metachlorians here with you today. But um, what a force is, is it's basically an interaction that causes the, uh, an object to change its motion, its direction, or its uh, size or shape. Uh, and they're measured in newtons. They're, these are the units for force. You probably already know that from science 10 or if you've taken uh, physics. Um, and they're named after Sir Isaac Newton. And Sir Isaac Newton, who is the guy who supposedly got hit on the head with an apple, I'm not sure if that actually happened, but what I can tell you happened is he came up with three laws of motion that we still use today. The first one, the first law of motion, states that an object in motion or at rest will remain at motion or at rest unless it's acted upon by an external force uh, that that will change it from either moving to being, you know, to stopping it or slowing it down, or if the object is not moving, that you apply a force to make it move. Uh, that's his first law. His second law was the formula for force, which you may, or may be very familiar with. Force is equal to mass times acceleration, which is a very common uh, formula used in science and physics, and you would have learned that in, uh, I think most likely in science 10, you would have learned that. And the third law of motion, which is my favorite, for every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. That's how rockets work. A uh, rocket will blast the fuel downward, which causes the rocket to move in an upward direction. That's the action, that's the reaction. They're moving in opposite directions from each other. It's a classic example of Newton's third law of motion. If you want to see more about Isaac Newton, take a watch of this video. It discusses his contribution to science, and it was huge. Uh, we're still obviously you know, living in a Newtonian world as far as uh, force is concerned. I mean, his definitions are still holding up today on basically the, the, um, the, the rudimentary aspects of what a force is. Now, as I mentioned, there are four forces that bind the galaxy together or the universe together. Um, and from strongest to weakest, they are as follows. The first, the strongest one is going to be strong nuclear forces that hold atoms together. Very small range on those forces, though. They're microscopic ranges. Uh, you've then got electromagnetic forces that are caused by uh, objects that exude electromagnetic energy, like a star, for example. They have an infinite range is how far this, this force will travel. Weak nuclear forces also have a short range. These are going to be ones that maybe hold molecules together like covalent bonds. And then you've got gravitational forces, which are exuded by any object that has mass in the universe. And they also have an infinite range. We're going to be spending the majority of our unit discussing uh, electromagnetic forces and gravitational forces, um, obviously because it's an electromagnetic uh, energy unit. But those are the two forces that we're going to be focusing on in great depth uh, during uh, this unit. Uh, okay. So let's start off with electricity because it's electromagnetic. What's electrical force? Well, electrical force is based on the movement of electrons, which are subatomic particles that are negatively charged. Uh, you already know that substances can either be neutral, negative, or positively charged based on the ratio of the number of electrons to the number of protons. Equal number of protons and electrons, you've got a neutral substance like an atom. If you've got uh, more electrons and protons, you've got a negatively charged substance. If you've got more protons and electrons, you've got a, uh, a positively charged substance. I almost lost my train of thought there. Um, as you may remember, negatively charged particles are going to attract, are going to be attracted to positively charged particles and vice versa. Negatively charged substances are going to repel from negatively charged substances and positive and positive substances are going to repel one another as well. It's the old adage, opposites attract. And that's going to come into quite a bit this unit, whether it's uh, charge whether it's the polarity of magnets, the opposite poles or the opposite charges are always going to attract one another. 
and the light poles or the light charges are always going to repel one another, and there are going to be some ramifications as we get into our, our field lines, as I'll be discussing here later today. Now, I've used the word charge a lot here in the last little bit. You've used a charge quite a bit in science. Um, you know, uh, sodium, it's got a, sodium ions have got a, a, one, a positive one charge, you know. Uh, you know that, that substance is positively or that substance is negatively charged. What does charge mean? Strictly speaking, what does charge mean? A uh, charge is measured, uh, it, it's designated by the letter Q. Little Q is the designation for charge. And charge is measured in a unit called Coulombs, which are named after Charles Coulomb, who was a French physicist who did some early work on electrochemistry. Now, what is charge? Charge, strictly speaking, is the physical property of matter that causes it to experience a force when placed in electrical or electromagnetic fields. So if I have a substance that has no charge, it's neutrally charged, it's probably not going to react at all when you put it into an electrical or an electromagnetic field. However, if that substance has a, a bigger charge, the forces that can act on it once you put it into an electromagnetic field are going to be greater because it's got that charge. It can move electrons either to it or away from it, depending on whether it's positive or negatively charged. That is what charge is by definition. And again, it's measured in Coulombs, uh, which is named after Charles Coulomb. You might also remember back to Science 9 or in your earlier science classes that there's a lot of uh, units in uh, electricity that are named after scientists. Volts are named after Volta. Ohms named after Georg Ohm. Uh, amps are named after the French physicist uh, Ampere. Um, when you use these units in science, if you ever have a unit that's named after a person, Watt is named after another one. There's another one. The hour is named after uh, James Watt. Um, the, if, you, if you use these units in science, generally speaking, the unit itself will not be capitalized. So if I have newtons, if I have the units newtons, they're going to be small n, e, w, t, o, n, s. If I'm talking about Isaac Newton, then I would capitalize it because it's in his name. So keep that in mind. So if I mentioned that if I have the sentence, Coulombs, the units called Coulombs are named after Charles Coulomb, then Coulombs, the units named Coulombs, that would be small letter C, and Coulombs in Charles Coulomb's name would be capitalized. Keep that in mind because there's a lot of units in science that are named after scientists, and in all cases they're generally they're 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 written with small, uh, they're not capitalized as you might think, because they're named after a person. Um, so what is a Coulomb? A Coulomb is kind of like a mole. We talked about moles in, um, in the last unit, which was um, basically a number that was 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd uh, number of atoms or molecules of a substance. And I said that the best way to think of moles would be like, you know what a dozen eggs is. Well, like this is just a giant, this is a, a single designation for a very large number. Coulombs are the same way. Coulombs are like sort of like the moles of electricity, except now we're not dealing with atoms. We're dealing with electrons. One Coulomb is equal to 6.25 times 10 to the 18th electrons that are needed. to. That's, that's the number of electrons required to make a charge of one Coulomb. So a lot of electrons are required to make a charge of one Coulomb. Because of that, we often use smaller designations for Coulombs. We sometimes will use millicoulombs which is one one thousandth of a coulomb, or we might use microcoulombs, which is designated by this little weird U that has almost like a little drop on the on the, um, the left side, it almost looks like a Q that isn't quite drawn properly. But that little weird U, little U with the C means microcoulombs, and that is one one millionth of a coulomb, as mentioned here on the bottom of the page. So let's use an example to discuss charge. Let's use a thunderhead because we see lots of thunderheads in Alberta during the summer. Uh, thunderstorms are very common here. Why do we get thunderstorms? Why do they develop? Well, here's what happens. Water is moving up and down inside of a thundercloud. Uh, warm water that's near the bottom of the cloud is actually turning to vapor and it's rising. Colder water on the top of the cloud is condensing and, and falling down to the bottom of the cloud. The water that's falling, that's condensing, is able to hold on to its electrons more easily than the water vapor that's rising. So what occurs is you'll get a charge separation inside the, the cloud. The tops of the clouds will become positive while the bottom of the, the clouds become negative. Well, we notice, I would mention this, positive is attracted to negative and vice versa. Well, if I get charge buildups in two parts of my cloud, a static charge will begin to build. And eventually, there's going to be enough of a static buildup 
that we're going to want to discharge that that charge. It's no different than you rubbing your feet on a carpet and then you know z- zapping you know your your brother or your sister who's sitting in the chair if you've got your little fuzzy slippers on. It's sort of the same idea, but on a much larger scale. So when this occurs, the cloud will then pass over the ground. Now the ground is technically neutral. It's a neutral ground, but the thing is. The ground is comprised of a negative and positively charged particles, which will begin to align themselves depending on where the cloud heads are. So the positive parts of the ground, the, the, the particles of the ground that are positively charged, will be attracted to the bottom of the thunderclouds because there's negatively charged particles on the bottom of those thunderclouds. And then between the thunderclouds, you're going to have the negatively sectioned charges of ground. So you'll get what's called charge separation, which we you discussed uh, as early as back in grade nine, in grade nine science when you discussed electricity. So what's going to happen is you're going to get discharges between the negative and the positively charged sections of the ground uh, or between the clouds. Um, and here's an example of lightning here in Toronto uh, zapping on the highest piece of real estate in Toronto, which is the CN Tower. It, it's the shortest position for that for that uh, electrical current to get down to the ground. It's going gonna, it's gonna to zap the highest piece of real estate. If that happens to be you walking on a flat piece of ground, that's why you're always supposed to get down low if you're ever caught in a thunderstorm or never stand below a tree because trees are the highest piece of real estate in the area. They're more likely to get hit by a piece of lightning than a piece of low-lying ground because the electricity wants to find the quickest and the fastest way to, to discharge from one point to the other. So that's why it's always important to stay low and away from trees in a thunderstorm. Watch this video here about lightning if you're interested about what lightning does and all the fascinating stuff that happens about lightning, uh, electricity-wise and otherwise. It's, it's, it's fascinating stuff, lightning, uh, to say the least. Here's another diagram for you here that I drew, sort of the same one I drew up on a whiteboard. It gives you another look at, di- at the, the charge separation that's occurring in the clouds and the charge separation that's occurring on the ground. Um, the movement of electrons from one place to another also depends on what kind of a substance you're moving through. <clears throat> you can have what are called conductive substances or conductors, or you can have insulative substances or insulators. Insulators like nonmetals, molecular compounds, uh, ionic compounds that are not dissolved in water, these have electrons that are very tightly bound to their nuclei, which means the electrons are not free to move, and without the movement of electrons, you can't create an electrical current. So these are substances that will not allow easy passage for electrons to move through them. That's why when we create electrical wires, we, we, we coat them in rubber. The rubber around the electrical wire is the insulator. Inside the electrical wire, the actual metal portion, that's the conductor. That's what's actually going to conduct the electrical signal. And these conductors are going to be like metals, uh, acids and bases, ionic compounds that are dissolved in water. These are substances that have electrons that are more loosely configured around the atoms. And these electrons are more free to move. So they're able to move more freely to create an electrical current because, remember, electricity is all about the movement of electrons. So that's the difference between an insulator or a conductor. If you're standing below the electric, the, uh, the thundercloud, you're an insulator. Sorry, you're, you're a conductor, pardon me, because you're full of water that has ionic compounds in it. You're essentially a massive conductor. That's why if the lightning, if you're the tallest piece of real estate, that lightning is going to go right through you because you're a conductive surface to try to ground out to the actual positive charge of the ground. So that's why it's dangerous if you're underneath a thundercloud, if you're the tallest piece of real estate out there. Uh, don't, just because you're not made of metal doesn't mean you can't conduct electricity. All right, so how do we actually measure this energy? What we're going to use is we're going to use a formula. And this is one of the only formulas in this course. Please listen to what I'm about to say. This formula is not in your data booklet. You have to know this one. This, I don't know why. It's just not in your data booklet. This, this is the formula you need to know. You're going you're gonna to measure energy, and we're going to measure energy in what we call voltage, which I've already discussed a little bit earlier today. Voltage represents the electrical potential difference, the ability for electrons to move. That's what it is. It's the potential for electrons to move in an electrical current. That's what we call voltage. We're going to measure voltage by calculating this. We're going to take a change in the potential energy of, of the substance that's, you know, that has the, the – the electricity, that's going to be measured in joules, and we're going to divide that by the actual charge of the substance, which is measured in coulombs. So the formula is going to be voltage equals delta Ep divided by Q, or voltage equals uh, the change in potential energy divided by 
the charge of the substance. All right. Let's do an example of this. It's in the uh, it's on the the notes here. Hopefully you got your notes up in front of you. I don't have it up on the board in front of me here, but if you're following along on the notes, this would be a good place to pause, get the notes up on your screen, and actually try to see if you can calculate this one on your own. I've got an appliance in your kitchen that's plugged into a 120 volt uh, socket that uses 15 coulombs of charge per second. If the cord becomes frayed and you grabbed it with wet hands, calculate the energy that would be transferred to you in one second. It's always based on one second, this calculation. So what am I going to use? Well, I'm going to use my formula, voltage equals uh, change in potential energy divided by charge. So I've been given the voltage, which is 120. That's going to be equal to my delta EP divided by 15 coulombs. Uh, in order to isolate my delta EP, I'm going to move my 15 coulombs over to the other side of the equation. That's going to be 120 volts times 15 coulombs. That is going to give me uh, 20 uh, and by the way, voltage is essentially joules divided by coulombs, so it's going to be uh, 120 joules divided by coulombs times 15 coulombs. The coulombs actually cancel out in that, uh, that uh, equation, which leaves me with my delta EP being 1,800 joules, or if I want to convert it to kilojoules, it would be 1.8 kilojoules. And there will be a couple of examples on the questions that I'm assigning you for homework with this lesson to practice that formula here. Uh, later today. All right, last stage. Let's talk about fields now. This whole section is called field lines. Well, let's talk about electrical fields. Okay, charged particles, when we have them, are always going to generate what are called electrical fields. Electrical fields. Uh, the property of the space around the charge enables the charge to exert forces on other charges that enter the region. So again, the more charge I have in a substance, if I have an electromagnetic field or an electrical field that's been generated, if an object comes into that field that has a charge, it's going to feel the force much more than an object that doesn't have a charge. The more charge it has, the more it's going to feel the force of that electrical field that's being generated by another object that's exerting the charge because it's got a charge of its own. Uh, for example, an electrical field created by a storm cloud and the ground describes how much force and in what direction the charged particles uh, would go if they're in that field. So what you can see here in the diagram on the page here is you can see a bunch of lines that have been drawn. And you can see all the lines are moving from areas of positive charge. They're moving to toward areas of negative charge. So my electrical field lines are always moving from areas that are positively charged to areas that are negatively charged. That's how the electrical fields flow, from positive to negative. Now, the magnitude and the direction of the lines are, are called, these are called your field lines. And on the diagram here, I've got two electrical field lines, or two electrical fields that have been generated. And you can see there are different field lines represented on those two diagrams. Now, a couple things to keep in mind. The closer together the field lines are in a diagram, the stronger the field is. So if you look at this diagram, A and B, which of those two fields, of those electrical fields, has a stronger electrical field? Is it going to be a field A or a field B just by looking at the lines that have been drawn? I'll give you a second to think about that. The one that's got the stronger field is going to be B because the lines on, in B's diagram are tighter together. The analogy would be if you look at isobars on a weather map. When you see a weather map and you see isobars which measure differences in pressure on a weather map, the closer those isobars are together, the, the, the bigger the change in pressure between one area and another. And generally speaking, if you see close isobars on a weather map, you generally will have higher winds because there is a bigger change in pressure from the area of high pressure to low pressure. It's a very short distance between that area of high to low pressure. The winds are going to blow harder. In this case, because the lines are closer together, that indicates that the field strength of the electrical field is actually stronger. So anytime you see two fields being represented with field lines, the closer the lines are together, the stronger the field's going to be. And that will apply whether it's an electrical field, whether it's a magnetic field, or whether it's a gravitational field. That rule applies for all three of the fields that we're going to be dealing with for this part of the video. All right. Uh, and again, please remember that when you have an electrical field, 
the general rule is that the fields always move from a, uh, from a positive charge to a negative charge. That's how the electrical field lines always are drawn. The arrow is always pointing from the positive charge toward the negative charge. Okay, let's take a look at magnetic fields. Magnetic fields uh, are created by magnetic substances. And what's a magnetic substance? They're substances that align electrons to move all in the same direction. And these create what are called magnetic fields. And magnets have, they don't have charge, but they have poles. They have a north and a south pole. And just like charges, opposite poles attract one another. So you've got a north and a south pole. The north pole is attracted to the south pole and vice versa. If I put two north poles of two magnets together, they're going to repel one another. If I put two south poles together of two magnets, they're going to repel one another as well. You can see that happening here. Here's two north poles repelling each other. See the, see the field lines are, are pulling away from each other. They're not moving toward each other. In the case of this one here, I've got a north to south magnet here. You can see that my, my field lines, and in the case of a magnetic field, the field lines uh, are moving from the north to the south pole only. So whenever you see a magnetic diagram, you should always know that the field lines are always going from the north pole to the south pole of a, of a given magnet. And in the case of a magnet all by itself, you can see that the north pole does have an interaction with the south pole on the other side of the magnet, and then the other sides just sort of kind of pull away. But the general rule with magnetic fields, north, uh, the field lines always move from a north to a south pole. All right. And the final one is a gravitational field. And if you want to have any information about gravitational fields, watch this video up here about gravitational fields. It's a very interesting video. Uh, gravitational fields are always produced by any object that has mass. I produce gravity. You produce gravity. Um, this, this, this whiteboard produces gravity. This, this produces gravity. Anything with mass produces gravity. We may not be able to perceive the gravitational field being produced by it, but obviously the larger the mass of the object, the more gravity that it will exert. Um, gravitation, uh, gravity is basically the property of space around uh, the mass uh, to exert forces on the mass of other objects. So for example, because I've got more mass than this, this pen, I would exert more gravity on the pen than the, gra the, the, the pen would exert on me. Neither one of us is being, it's not like if I let go of this pen, it's going to get sucked into me. Because right now there's another gravitational field that's stronger than both me and the pen. It's called the Earth, right? The Earth right below me is exerting the largest gravitational field you know, right, right next to me. So if I had a big enough mass, and in theory, things would start falling toward me, but I'm not that big. I'm not big enough to exert that kind of, mag that magnitude of gravity where objects essentially, uh, you know, fall on me. Uh, which is what we consider to be gravity. When we think of gravity, we think of the Earth having gravity. But every single object on the Earth is exerting a small amount of gravity as well because it has mass. The, 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 the field lines for gravity are always going to move toward the object with mass. So if I'm, you know, like here's an object with mass in my diagram, you'll notice all the field lines are moving directly toward the center of that object with the mass. And uh, that's how the field lines will be drawn for an object that's, uh, that's exerting a gravitational field. And finally, uh, how do you know that gravity, gravity is being exerted? How do you know that um, an electrical field is being exerted? How do you know that a magnetic field is being exerted? You use what's called a test body. A test body is, a, an, is an observable object that if you place it in the presence of any one of these fields, you're going to see some kind of a reaction from the object. So for example, if you're in a lightning storm, let's say you're below a lightning storm, or there's a lightning storm in the area, your hairs will begin to stick up on edge. You become a test object because essentially your hairs are basically becoming attracted to the negative charge at the bottom of the thundercloud. That rise of the hair, uh, you know, you're, you're positive in relation to the thunderhead. That is a test object. You become a test object because there's a visible sign that you're interacting with the electrical field that's being exerted by the lightning or the, the thunderhead. <clears throat> Compasses. Compasses are also test objects because they always point toward the North Pole or the magnetic North Pole. And the Earth exhibits a magnetic field as well. So um, a compass is a test object which shows that there is a, a magnetic field in play on the Earth. And we will get to that a little bit later in the unit. And finally, if you're climbing a mountain and you've got a climber's rope on the side of a mountain, the tension on the rope with the climber attached to it 
that's indicating that there is a, a gravitational pull going on, that the pull of gravity is pulling the, the rope and the, and the climber on the rope uh, downward toward the earth. That would also be classified as a cast body. And that's my discussion for uh, field lines today. For homework, can you complete uh, practice questions 1, 3, 4, 5, and 7 and 8 on pages 314 to 321? And questions uh, 2, 3, and 4 on page 227. Next day, we're going to get into the math behind all of these fields, whether they're uh, magnetic, gravitational, or electrical. We're going to get really involved in math next day when we discuss the equations for calculating field strength of all of these three types of fields. Until then, thanks for tuning in, and we will see you next time.